Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained. Holy crap, I'm so psyched and humbled as a channel hit over 100 subscribers last night. I only started this up a month ago and it has been phenomenal to see the growth and support this channel is getting. I wanted to thank you all for the feedback and suggestions. It really helps and gives me an idea as to the direction I should be heading in. With that in mind, it's time to go to the dark and scare ourselves again with Volume 2 of Aliens, Outbreak. Outbreak is the first book of five in Chapter 1 of the Alien Omnibus Anthology. Written by Mark Verhayden, the story picks up ten years after the events of the movie Aliens. Hicks is still a marine, but has had constant alcohol and violence issues that have seen him in and out of prison. He has not recovered from witnessing the annihilation of his squad. Newt is in a mental hospital where doctors are trying to cure her from her alien nightmares. They are essentially planning on turning her into a vegetative state to ease everyone's mind. What we are realizing, however, is that the nightmares aren't just being witnessed by Newt, but several other people around the world. As Hicks is about to depart on a mission to head to the alien homeworld, plans are being put into play by a nefarious corporation wishing to sabotage Hicks' mission and retrieve an alien sample for themselves. We return to Newt, who tells us that her family had embarked on the journey to LV-426. She explains that she was actually born on a terraformer transport in deep space. When they arrived on the moon, they saw that it was a desolate rock in which they initially christened Rim. We're told that her parents had volunteered for the mission, as we see them enter a chamber filled with facehugger eggs. We're also told that she was the only survivor from Hadley's Hope, and that once she had arrived on Earth, the doctors had essentially lost interest in her when she didn't respond to their treatment. We can see one of her dreams play out, as she tells us there is a bright circular light above her head, and that it is humming softly. She looks into space and says that she can only see the cold void of hell. Hicks exits a brothel with a bottle of liquor. He is clearly a mess here as he explains that he had never needed anyone before, but seems to be falling apart. He is burdened with grief and guilt for being the only marine to survive. He says that he has to stay clear for the mission and apologizes to Newt, saying that he will leave but she has to stay here. She may be miserable where she is now, but he is essentially heading to hell and thinks that it would be improper to bring Newt to such a dangerous place. We arrive at a government office. We have two people who appear to be discussing Higgs. Stevens doesn't like the idea of having an unstable marine on the mission and uh, seems to be really annoyed that command has cleared him. Hicks is on the mission for the same reason he was kept as a marine. He has experience. Stevens is begging to have Hicks removed, but is repeatedly told that Hicks is there to stay and is supervising the grunts with loading operations. Stevens sulkily says that he understands. We head to the loading area where Stevens is yelling at one of the grunts. He asks what was in the crates, and uh, the Marine tells him that it's carrying plasma rifles and explosives. He then orders him to tell Hicks to meet him in his office. Once Hicks arrives, Stevens starts to undermine him, asking who authorized him to load the plasma weapons. Hicks coolly replies, saying that he was told to prepare the ship. <laughs> Stevens is essentially lecturing him about how unstable plasma weapons were, and suggests that his past experience is clouding his judgment. That is a very stupid thing to do and say just to get the upper hand in a conversation. Seriously. Hicks tells him that the first time they face off with him, they will wish they had something stronger. He is told to take them off and is excused. We know from the movie Aliens that the Marines were wiped out within minutes after their high powered weapons had been taken from them. We can see two men playing some sort of vintage squash game against each other while talking business. What they tell us is that the government is putting together a secret operation to grab alien life forms for themselves. They both agree that they can't have that as aliens are the next step in competitive biological weaponry. They explain that they already have interest from a few countries including Canada, Japan and Ireland. We're also informed that there is one man, Massey, who is being groomed for the mission to sabotage his ship. It is explained that he was a Harvard graduate who also studied at Cornell. He essentially could have worked for any of the big companies, but decided to enlist for the Marines instead. He was awarded the Silver Star for bravery, had a couple of hundred confirmed kills and more decorations than a Christmas tree before he was court-martialed. 
It is explained that he tried to kill his commanding officer for not allowing him to attack the civilian encampment. He is basically an intelligent psycho. This company had paid off the military tribunal to ensure that they could use him. We return to Newt, who is having another nightmare about the Queen Mother. She says although her mother is dead, her true mother is part of her. She can feel her filling her lungs and stomach. She tells us that her teeth glitters like the stars, and that she was impossibly beautiful. Newt says that the Queen Mother loves her more than anyone else ever could. The illustrations here are disgustingly marvellous. We return to the Marines who are being trained by Hicks. During the training exercises, we can see two of them pinned down and receiving heavy fire from a bunker. One of them suggests the idea of running behind it and blasting the service port. He makes a break for it and disables the bunker. His friend gets out of cover and starts to celebrate prematurely, saying, Dead on, buddy! He is immediately shot in the chest by Hicks, who has exited the bunker, and says, Yeah, dead on, buddy. <laughs> The grunt is in shock and surprised to see Hicks standing over him. Now, Hicks tells him to get up before the mud short circuits his suit. This may seem cruel, but he is responsible for the lives of these men and is essentially trying to teach them how to survive. He explains that Beulah and Easley were stupid, as you should never assume anything in battle. He tells him that due to Beulah's death, they were going to do the course all day till some of what he says sinks in. The group look at Beulah and complain. <laughs> My soccer coach would do the same freaking thing. Make everybody do push-ups and sit-ups for one person's mistake. You know, in his mind, he thinks that it's going to make you less likely to do it next time. Which he was right, but he was still a dick. <laughs> we see that Hicks is impressed with the unit he is commanding. He may never say that to their face, as he wouldn't want them to get cocky or complacent. But he tells us that they are working well as a team. This has started to remind him of his team that were wiped out on Hadley's Hope. He immediately snaps himself out of it and tells us that this wasn't about duty, honor, or loyalty, and that it was for him and no one else. We return to the hospital where Newt is being escorted to a room with two doctors by a security officer. Once she is seated, they inform her that after discussing her problem at length, the doctors feel that surgery is the only option. They tell her that since she was a minor with no next of kin, they did not need permission to go ahead, but thought it was important to tell her why. Newt is begging here, saying that she will be good and that she aims to try harder. They explain that they have no choice but to burn her brain tissue in specific areas to make sure she doesn't feel anything ever again. We can see that Hicks has accessed the hospital records and discovered their plan. He says that less than 12 hours before liftoff, he had told Stevens he had last minute business to take care of. He tells us that accessing the hospital mainframe was a mistake, as after seeing what they were going to do, there was only ever going to be one course of action. We see Hicks enter the reception area. A guard tells him he needs to pass a retinal scan, but Hicks simply karate chops him before bursting through a door. After he breaks through the first door, he grabs one of the nurses as she attempts to call security. He tells her to look at his face, and that it was scary, <laughs> before asking for Newt's location. We see a security guard sneak up behind him, but Hicks is a deadly killing machine. He takes him out with ease before explaining his motivations to us. I mean, of course, he cares for Newt. He loves her. But he also tells us that his squad had faced hell to save this girl, and now they wanted to destroy her. Newt is the only thing left of his group, and he can't afford to let that go. He bursts into her room as he tells her they are going for a ride. He picks Newt up and tells her that she looks like crap. She says, look who's talking, <laughs> as he devises a plan to get out. He tells us her room is on the 40th floor, and that the ground exits would be swarming with security by now. We see him playing with the power cables, before picking Newt up and running off to avoid the bullets. He then tells Newt to hold tight. We witness the wall blow out from the force of the explosion. Hicks had borrowed a high-rise fire rescue ship from the fire brigade to make their exit. He explains that by the time they trace it back to him, he will essentially be long gone. He then continues by saying that one of the joys of doing a suicide mission is that reprimands and court-martials lose their sting. He flips the remote on as we see them burst off at Mark II. Hicks smuggles Newt past a marine at the front of the ship. The marine asks him if something is wrong and Hicks replies that yes, and that the Dodgers were still in LA. <laughs> he straps Newt into a hypersleep chamber 
As he explains, Marines are just like people, in that sometimes they do things, not because it's right or wrong, but because they must. Newt asks him if they are really going back, as he closes the hatch. We can see that the whole unit has been strapped in. As they take off, Hicks tells us that Stevens was going to be trouble, as removing those weapons to teach him a lesson was stupid. Regardless of this, he still feels sorry for Stevens and the other grunts, as he feels he is dragging them off into his war. We see the ship take off, as Hicks tells us he no longer had any doubts and that nothing was going to stop him. We get back to the two men in the shady corporation, Bionational, who were trying to sabotage the government mission. They inform us that they had a last minute issue with their number one man, Massey. Apparently, one of the communications people had sent Massey some classified mail that his son and wife had found. They are both horrified by what they see. What we then witness is the mother comforting her son. Massey walks in. She had confronted him about what she saw, and he essentially killed his wife of six years and their son. He took the pain to make it look like a robbery too, as we see the police comforting him. We are told that under the circumstances, the company thought that he performed admirably and cleared him for the mission. They ask what it would feel like to be a sociopath and speculate that it would probably be liberating. We see the government vessel Benedict take off, but also see that Bionational have sent their own ship, the K014, in pursuit of it. We are told that the government is seeking to retrieve the specimens of alien life forms for its weapons development program. We are told that the K014 has two mission parameters. The first is to follow the Benedict to the alien homeworld and gather biological data on the life form. The second is to inhibit the Benedict's crew from retrieving a viable test subject. It is explained that Captain Massey has been given carte blanche towards this end. Carte blanche is a French phrase meaning unlimited discretionary power to act and unrestricted authority. We will come to find out how much of a mistake this was down the track. In the meantime, Bionational has been conducting research on a human specimen that appears to be a survivor who managed to eject himself from a cargo vessel, the Junket. We are told that his pod had been damaged, causing loss of atmosphere, but his vital signs were somehow preserved by the infusion of an alien life form. We can see that this pilot is also experiencing the same nightmares as Newt. We are told that another patient is also having nightmares. The patient explains that she was on a train with her mother and starts to hear a scraping sound before the train stops. She then sees things on the outside trying to get in before they immediately surround her. What we then see is her mother changing into the queen mother. We see the case files of a few more patients. One of them explains he is sleeping before the TV turns on. He then begins to see some distortion before something comes out at him from inside the screen. All of their dreams start off the same way in that they are remembering a memory from their past, but each of their dreams quickly turn dark as the Queen Mother begins to make her presence known. We are told that there are dozens of patients that seem to be exhibiting the same nightmares. The descriptions of the creatures also seem to be consistent. Their experts have surmised that there are different modes of communication for the aliens, suggesting that they have some sort of telepathy. They are trying to figure out why the aliens are communicating to them. And that is the end of Volume 2 of Aliens Outbreak. I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think in the comments section. If you have, don't forget to hit like and to subscribe to stay up to date on all my content. I'm Niat with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.